Welcome back to Her The Nerd and this part three, is it now, of the Moneyball series as today we're looking at transfers slash trialists. I'm going to go through both because they're both important and both have uh, individual questions and slight tweakings on the rules um, that you have to abide by and people will just get at you if you don't cover them. So yeah, we're going to go through transfers and trialists today. So how do we go for transfers? Who do we look for? Um, how do we actually go through and ensure we get the best cost for them? Uh, and trialists, which are a massive part of keeping your team flowing after you've gone through that scouting. Uh, if this is the first video you're hitting, there are two videos that came before. One was the introduction to Moneyball and the five key rules that we stick to for running a Moneyball save in FM. And the second was around scouting and how we set up scouting to be most efficient, to get the most out of our money uh, because of the limitations we have around transfers and squad size uh, to ensure you don't ever have to panic buy when you get to this crucial point of transfers. So if you are enjoying the series, make sure you hit that like button, the subscribe and the notification bell on YouTube. And we do stream the, the Moneyball MK series live on Twitch every Monday and Wednesday, 7.30 till 12. So uh, make sure you check out and follow the channel down below. Links are all in the description. So let's first talk about transfer spend in general. The number one rule that we had from video one was about net wage spend. So net wage spend must be controlled, not really transfer spend. If you need to spend money, then spend money. If you don't, don't. I myself, I'm an incredibly tight uh, football manager player. I don't like spending money in it. I'm not making money. I don't like spending money so much. And the team we picked, MK Dons, for our money will save, actually have some uh, unique um, problems in that they have a lot of financial issues. They're very big facilities uh, that they can't afford in League One. They need, need to get up through the league. So you're constantly trying to restructure the financial debt as one of your visions. So we need to make money year on year which they steal from me, essentially, for transfer spend. Uh, one of the other um, rules that we've got is obviously signing players uh, up to the age of 27, to not sign anyone older than 27, even if the bargain presents itself, because the idea is a player is an asset, we need to turn a profit on that asset. Any, high, any older than 27, we lose the ability to possibly turn them around because they haven't got enough life left in them as a player. Uh, a bit of a cruel way of seeing it, um, but that is kind of the reality. And then when it comes to selling, uh, uh, sorry, and one more on the signing players is signing players for the first team. So no signing youth players or reserve players or potential players. Signing players that will come in and kick someone out of that first team or will get straight in and add something to that first team. Um, we don't have reserve teams. We don't have backup teams. So you are buying a very few players each year just to improve the performance of the team or replacing players that have left. And that brings us on to the one rule around selling players is that you will have to sell players if their value is met. Transfer windows can be very stressful in a money ball scenario because if a bid comes in for a player that you were not expecting, it's likely going to be a big bid. Uh, and if you can push it and it meets that valuation of the player, that player should leave. So therefore you have to be ready to then go straight into the transfer market and buy that replacement you need. Or hopefully you've got them sat on your reserve bed, on your sub bench and then we can fall in. But you will need to dip into that transfer market more regularly uh, and usually at short notice. So having obviously the scouting rules from the last video in place will help you make those decisions. So I think a good place to start is if we jump straight into the game itself. And let me walk you through my transfer history, I suppose, of the last four years to kind of explain a little bit about how transfers and trialists play such a big uh, part of what goes uh, on in a kind of a money ball approach. So you see from our first season, we had to go out straight away. Uh, the MK Dons had a very unique problem of having four players in the first team over the age of 34, I think it was, uh, which was pretty crazy. So we had to do some stuff about that there. Um, so we, we made a bit of money flogging out some players that we could for value straight away that didn't fit into our team. Anyone from the young the youth team that we could just get rid of were gotten rid of completely. And then we went out into the free transfer market to try and find players. You don't have any statistics on players to follow the scouting approach we originally talked about. Um, if you're in the first season, one. And two, if you're looking at youngsters that are coming from those big Premier League youth academies that haven't played games, or the game just hasn't given them any data. Um, so then you have to come up with an approach for how you sign these players using a statistical approach, but without having any statistics. That's where trialists come into it. Uh, so you'll see here we signed the a vast majority of free transfers in the first season. We look at the second season. Again, vast majority of free transfers. Most seasons, actually, to be fair, we filled in with a fair few freebies. The first two seasons very much relied on them. Uh, and there was no data for these players. So what we had to do uh, 
and if I'll show you my schedule for most seasons, last season was not so bad, is run a lot of friendlies. We perfected this approach second season, I realized, when there was no statistics available. So what we would do is run as many friendlies as we could, two or three a week, and then play full teams of trialists. So you've looked and scouted some of those players, they've got no statistics, or you've not been able to scout them at all, they're just freebies that you want to take a look at. You trial every man and his dog, and then you play. I think the second season I had two teams of trialists and my first team. So you start your friendlies, uh, luckily we were playing a load of Tosh teams as well, and you start then playing the players in the roles, in the formation that you want to play them in, uh, and then you trial a team against uh, a, a, another team, uh, you then rotate each of those teams, so trialist one team plays on a Monday, trialist two team plays on a Wednesday, your first team might play on the Saturday, and then you start to bring some of those trialists into the first team mould, where they, they might fit and you bring them in, start signing them up then on contracts as well as you go but you're gonna to have to play like 10 to 15 friendlies to build up the data, just the in-game data for those players. So you'll be able to see their in-game roles. You're gonna to have to do a lot more of looking at them individually. It'll build up your knowledge as well because you'll get them scouted whilst they're playing for you. And then you just have to make the decision based on essentially them playing four or five friendly games for you about whether they're gonna fall into your first team. Be warned, you have to play your first team as well because if you get to the end of the season and uh, the end of friendly, sorry, the end of preseason, you haven't played your first team, they won't be fit and they won't have gelled. So your last kind of five friendlies need to be your first team with those trialists that you've offered contracts to dropped in. But that is the way that I've gotten around having no data on players is uh, trialing them, putting them in a team full of trialists playing them then blended into my first team and then signing on contracts during that pre-season period. Uh, so it's a way of getting around people saying, well, if you don't have statistics, how do you even do it from season one? Well, this is how you do it from season one. You rely heavily on freebies, but the trialing system and friendlies to build in-house data for them, watching them play matches yourself, seeing how good they are, making a decision based on that. And then if we look at season two, I'll walk you through some of the bigger decisions we had to make. Season two was a big one. We brought in a lot of players because we released the end of season one, four or five first teamers who were like 35. That brought our net wage budget all the way down, which was great. And we started balancing off what was going on. So we brought a lot of players in to trial a new formation. We also let go uh, Lee Nichols, who was our top, uh, it was our first choice goalkeeper at the time, um, went out for 94,000, didn't seem a lot. And our best player, Scott Fraser, I didn't really want to sell him, but I had to make the decision. West Brom came in for him. He's now into Miami. And as our best central midfielder, uh, I had to make a decision of what his value was. So I think at the time he was worth about 1 million, 1 1.2, I think max. Uh, the bid came in for 2 million with future sell-on fees in there. We, uh, we negotiated a bit, but once he got locked in, that decision had to be made to let Scott Fraser go. That two million pounds brought in for Scott Fraser paid for us to get through the season. So it paid for us enough to get in. And whilst we then spent 48,000 on the flip side for players we were looking at. So we used the money well, but made a lot of money in the sales. That money again, sat in our account for a while until it was required. Uh, we did do a bit of work with statistics early on. We brought in uh, young Alex McSkeen. Um, still, uh, we're still going backwards and forwards on McSkeen and whether he's gonna be worth it or not. We paid 40K for him uh, from Gateshead. So you can see statistics wise, he was actually performing well on all statistics. So there was there was no valuation in there. He was scoring the goals. He was the top goal scorer in the Vanarama North. We needed a backup striker. So I took a punt on, on buying a Vanarama North player who was young, who was performing well to see if he could do it at our league. He scored a couple of very important goals for us that season he came in. I'll tell you that. There's a, there's a clip in the intro of my Twitch stream, which is all him. Uh, so yeah, we did use some statistics buying in that first season as well. But that selling of players enabled us next season to bring in Kean Harris and Zane Westbrook for combined 500,000. So we spent the money this season, didn't bring in as much on the sales side, but it was gained a year before. So it gave us the freedom to move when Bristol Rovers got relegated and we needed to bring in some players. Uh, we also brought in Jamie Timlin, who was, um, he was actually on the shortlist with uh, Alex McSkeen and the first season, the second season when we did definitely decided we needed another striker to be brought in, uh, he was there and already scouted and ready to go. So we used our shortlist again to buy players, but combined we spent 700,000, we made 2 million the year before. Uh, if we then roll forward to season three, Again, we sold players. This was a big season for selling players, brought in a lot of freebies, spent a little bit of money on players. Um, but let me talk about some big wins we had here. Uh, Jerry Mbaku, he's free at the beginning. We signed him at the beginning of the uh, 
of the save. He scored lots of goals for us. 26 goals first season, 15 second. And his theme was starting to tail off. He was 30. We actually made a fail on him. We sold him for 375k, bought him for nothing. So good turnaround. He had a bid come in in the January of the season before for 800,000 that I rejected. I should not have rejected that bid. I was scared about losing Jerry because he was the only one scoring at the time. I thought his value was higher. We ended up set. We ended up losing 400,000 potentially by not selling him earlier. Who knows what would have happened in that season? I nearly got fired uh, if he hadn't have been there. Um, so that was a big that was a big one for us. Um, and then the other large one, Regan Paul, a player that had been with us for a while, was eyeing him up kind of to be our captain, could play multiple positions. Uh, bid came in, he's now worth 3 million for them, but bid came in, he was worth 800,000 I think for us, sold for 1.8 million. We had then uh, already had right backs and stuff to fill in his positions, but big money made for him on that uh, sale. And the last one we made a big money on, Austin Samuels, um, which shows, uh, this kind of shows the money ball approach. Brought him in for free, from Wolves I think he comes from. Yeah, originally he brought him in for free, he scored 26 goals in his first season. That season was crazy for both Jerry and Austin. Uh, then died off a little bit and I, I wasn't feeling enough from him. I thought he was going to have a good season this season. I was willing to back him. Uh, and then a bid came in during transfer period out of nowhere for, uh, for 600k for, from FC Lyon. Um, so Austin Samuels went I, I was for 600k for a player that I wasn't 100% sure on. Had had two good seasons. I cashed in. Zero paid for him. 600k gained for him. Brilliant. I then reinvested in Timmy Abraham, who had a good few seasons. We've been scouting him for a while um, for Plymouth. Played in our league. They bought him for 89k um, from Fulham. Had a good season that first season and they kind of started to replace him. So I had a look at Timmy knowing that he had scored a lot of goals against us, had the right attributes for us to see if there was a bargain to be had. We bought him for 138k and so 600k gained for a striker out of form, 130k paid for a striker to come in. He scored 11 goals in nine appearances for us so far. So if he then turns around, his value for us will go up. If we can then have a good season this season, he's worth 325k already. Uh, and at 22, there's big money to be made on Timmy Abraham potentially. Uh, so that's kind of how our transfers have worked, what we've looked at, how we've scouted players over multiple years to get a real good view of them and how we use the trialist system to gain in-game statistics for where the statistics let us down on the scouting side. So we'll leave that there for transfers slash trialists. If you have any questions, again, hit us down in the comments below. If you have caught up on the, or haven't caught up on the other series, go and catch up on the rest of the series. We will be bringing through the season reviews of this season, uh, of this save, sorry, that's been live on Twitch onto YouTube as well, so you guys can get caught up. But do come and watch us live on Twitch, Mondays and Wednesdays, and ask us any questions you've got there on Moneyball. I'm happy to talk about it. Uh, so I'm hoping you are enjoying the series. Make sure you hit that like button, subscribe, hit the notification bell, and I'll see you back for the next one. We'll be talking about either contracts or transfer uh, or team selection and tactics. So I'll see you then. Have a great day. Bye-bye.